All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, tonight, we're going to look at uh, another sutta, a new sutra. Uh, tonight, we are still going to be in the Majima Nikaya. So we're still in the middle length discourses. We're skipping over one or so, and we're going to now read number 18, the Madhupindika Sutta, the, the honey ball. So uh, a few things to mention before I'll do a reading. And uh, if you've been coming to Dharma Doors lately, you know, I've been doing a, a reading of the whole sutta at the beginning and then followed by a discussion. So, but a few things to know before we dive in, just to make the reading that much more pleasurable. Um, we are, at, like last week, we are still in uh, Kapila Vastu, which if you remember is the Buddha's hometown. So these suttas are all taking place sort of where the Buddha was from. And if you remember last week, <clears throat> it was a Sakyan, a sort of a, a member of the Buddha's extended family who asked the question. Tonight, it's the same thing. This is going to be someone named uh, Dandapani. So Dandapani has a question for the Buddha, and that's going to kind of lead to the, the teaching. So Dandapani is a nickname and I think that you to know this is helpful going into the like reading it. So Dandapani, he's sort of a Buddhist. He's a lay, I think he's a, a householder, although I couldn't get that confirmed for sure. I think he is. But Dandapani is funny because his nickname means stick in hand. So a Danda is a stick. Pani is the palm, so Dandapani is stick in hand. But the thing about this guy, at least his backstory, is that, and it, it really speaks to his, his character. His backstory is that he was a very young guy, but he carried a golden walking stick and kind of like used it, even though he had no need for a walking stick. He wasn't old, he wasn't injured. But he, he kind of, you know, had this fancy walking stick. And that kind of speaks to his character in that way. So he's got a question for the Buddha. And they are in the Negrodha Park. Or actually, it's the Negrodha Dharma. <laughs> the Negrodha Dharma is this Negrodha's park. And Negrodha was a follower of the Buddha that donated a park. The Buddha hung out there a lot. And <clears throat> just to let you know ahead of time so that you can pay attention to it, this sutta is a pretty famous sutta. It's one of those early Buddhist sutras that is it's taught a lot, it's referenced a lot, it's spoken about a lot. And that's because it is dealing with one particular idea it's dealing with a lot of ideas, but one focus is something called prapanchya. What is going to be translated as mental proliferation. And it's one of the things that is the focus of the sutra is, is getting rid of and kind of overcoming mental proliferation. So this is a very interesting sutra for it's about the mind it's about the way the mind works. Ah, one other thing about this sutra. This sutra is so good, I have to tell you. So this sutra, so there was a few sutras before in, in the Majjhima Nikaya that I skipped that you, you may have noticed. I, di I didn't do them all. Some of them I didn't do mainly just because I didn't want to spend a whole hour and a half evening talking about it. Some of them I didn't do because they're sort of, they're a little more for monastics, like for celibate renunciants. And so I thought, you know, since we're not all celibate renunciants, I won't do those. 
And there was a couple of suttas that I skipped because there weren't, they're not actually given by the Buddha. They're taught by Shariputra. I think the one that I skipped is a sutra that's actually Shariputra. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't really feel like doing that one then. I, and I didn't actually want to get into the, the dynamics of a sutra that's not taught by the Buddha. But tonight is a great introduction because it's kind of a sutra that's partially by the Buddha and partially by Kachanda, the one of the Buddha's primary disciples. And so we'll get to see, like, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll get to see how a sutta deals with the teachings from the Buddha versus teachings from not the Buddha. And we'll get to see how those are dealt with respect, respectively in that way. All right, so that's, that's a few things to keep your eye out for. Keep your eye out for the topic of mental proliferation. Keep your eye out for Dandapani. And then keep your eye out for Mahakachana's explanation of what the Buddha taught. Yeah, I think that's all my notes I wanted to mention going into it. Yeah, so... Sutra number 18 of the Majjhima Nikaya, the Madhu Pindika Sutta, the Honey Ball. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country of Kapalavastu in Nigrodha's park. Then, when it was morning, the Blessed One dressed and taking his bowl and outer robe, went into Kapilavattahu for alms. When he had wandered for alms in Kapilavattahu and had returned from his alms round, after his meal, he went to the great wood for the day's abiding and entered the great wood, sat down at the root of a bilva sapling for the day's abiding. Dandapani, the Sakyan, while walking and wandering for exercise, also went to the great wood. And when he had entered the great wood, <clears throat> he went to the bill of a sapling where the Blessed One was and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he stood to one side, leaning on his stick, and asked the Blessed One, what does the recluse assert? What does he proclaim? Friend, I assert and proclaim in such a way that there is no quarreling with anyone in the world, no quarreling with its gods, its maras and brahmas, no quarreling in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and its people. I proclaim in such a way that perceptions no more underlie that Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, shed of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. When this was said, Dandapani the Sakyan shook his head wagged his tongue and raised his eyebrows until his forehead was puckered in three lines. Then he departed on his walking stick. Then when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to Nigrodha's park, where he sat down on a seat made ready for him and told the bhikkhus what had taken place with Dandapani. Then a certain bhikkhu asked the Blessed One, But venerable sir, how does the Blessed One assert and proclaim in such a way that he does not quarrel with anyone in the world, with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, in this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes and the people? And venerable sir, how is it that perceptions no more underlie the Blessed One, 
The Brahman who abides detached from sensual pleasures, without perplexity, free of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. Bhikkhu, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone, if nothing is found there to delight in, if nothing is found there to welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to attraction, the end of the underlying tendency to aversion, the end of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency for the desire for being, of the underlying tendency towards ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here, these evil unwholesome states cease without remainder. That's what the Blessed One said. Having said this, the Sublime One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling. Then, soon after the Blessed One had gone, the bhikkhus considered, Now, friends, the Blessed One has risen from his seat and gone into his dwelling after giving a summary in brief without expounding the detailed meaning. Now, who will expound this in detail? Then they considered, the Venerable Maha Kachchana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. He is capable of expounding the detailed meaning. Suppose we went to him and asked him the meaning of this. Then the bhikkhus went to the Venerable Maha Kachchana and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, they sat down to one side and told him what had taken place, adding, let the venerable Mahakachana expound it to us. The venerable Mahakachana replied, friends, it's as if though, it's as if someone needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, thought that heartwood should be sought for among the branches and leaves of a great tree standing possessed of heartwood, after they had already passed over the root and the trunk. And so it is with you, venerable sirs, that you think that I should be asked about the meaning of this after you already passed the blessed one by when you are face to face with the teacher. For knowing, the Blessed One knows. Seeing, he sees. He is vision. He is knowledge. He is the Dharma. He is the Holy One. He is the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the Amrita, the deathless ambrosia, the Lord of the Dharma, the Tathagata. That was the time when you should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. And as he told you, you should have remembered it. Surely, friend Kachana, knowing the Blessed One knows. Surely, seeing he sees. He, he is vision. He is knowledge. He is the Dharma. He is the Holy One. He's the sayer, the proclaimer, the elucidator of meaning, the giver of the deathless, the Lord of the Dharma, the Tathagata. That was the time when we should have asked the Blessed One the meaning. As he told us, yeah, we should have remembered it. Yet, the Venerable Mahakachana is praised by the teacher and esteemed by his wise companions in the holy life. 
The venerable Maha Kachanda is capable of expounding the detailed meaning of this summary given in brief by the Blessed One without expounding the detailed meaning. Let the venerable Maha Kachanda expound it without finding it troublesome. Then listen, friends, and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the bhikkhus replied, and the venerable Maha Kachanda said this. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat <clears throat> and went into his dwelling, after giving a summary in brief without expounding it in detailed meaning, that is, after he said bhikkhu, as to the source through which, men, through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, this is the end of the underlying tendency to attraction, the end of the underlying tendency to aversion, the underlying tendency to views, the end of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency to ignorance. This is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. I understand the detailed meaning of it to be as follows. Dependent upon the eye and visible forms, eye consciousness arises. The meaning of those three is contact. With contact as condition, there is vedana, sensations or feelings. What one feels, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, <clears throat> perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, with respect to the future, and present forms all cognizable by the eye. Dependent upon the ear and sounds, ear consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is called contact. With contact as condition, there is sensation. What one senses, that one perceives. What one perceives, that one thinks about. What one thinks about, that one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future, and present forms cognizable through the ear. Dependent upon the nose and sense, nose consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is sensation. What one senses, one perceives. What one perceives, that's what one thinks about. What one thinks about, that's what one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, the future, and present forms cognizable through the nose. Dependent upon the tongue and flavors, tongue consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is called contact. With contact as a condition, there is sensation. What one senses, that's what one perceives. What one perceives, 
that's what one thinks about. What one thinks about, that is what one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to the past, future, and present forms cognizable through the tongue. Dependent upon the body and tangible objects, bodily consciousness arises. The meeting of the three is contact. With contact as a condition, there is sensation. What one senses, that's what one perceives. What one perceives, that's what one thinks about. What one thinks about, that's what one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future, and present forms cognizable through the body. <clears throat> Dependent upon the mind and mental objects or thoughts. Mind consciousness arises. The meaning of the three is contact. With contact as condition, there is sensation. What one senses, that's what one perceives. What one perceives, that's what one thinks about. What one thinks about, that's what one mentally proliferates. With what one has mentally proliferated as the source, Perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset a person with respect to past, future, and present mind objects cognizable through the mind. When there is the I, a visible form, and I consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of sensations. When there is a manifestation of sensations, it's possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. And when there is the ear, sound, and ear consciousness, and when there is the nose, odors, and nose consciousness, and when there is the tongue, flavors, and tongue consciousness, and when there is the body, tangibles, and bodily consciousness, and when there is the mind, a mind object, and mind consciousness, it is possible to point out the manifestation of contact in all of those. When there is the manifestation of contact, it is possible to point out the manifestation of vedana, sensations. When there is the manifestation of sensations, it's possible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there is the manifestation of perception, it is possible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there is the manifestation of thinking, it is possible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is no I, no visible form, and no I consciousness, it is possible, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there's no manifestation of contact, it's impossible to point out any manifestation of a sensation. When there's no manifestation of any sensation, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of any perception. When there's no manifestation of perception, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's no manifestation of thinking, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. When there is no ear, no sound or sound consciousness, 
when there is no nose, no odor, or nose consciousness, when there is no tongue, no flavor, and no tongue consciousness, when there's no body, no tangible, and no bodily consciousness, and when there is no mind, no mental object, and no mind consciousness, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of contact. When there's no manifestation of contact, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of sensations. When there's no manifestation of sensations, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of perception. When there's no manifestation of perception, it's impossible to point out the manifestation of thinking. When there's no manifestation of thinking, it is impossible to point out the manifestation of being beset by perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation. Friends, when the Blessed One rose from his seat and went into his dwelling, after giving a summary in brief without expanding the detailed meaning, that is, when he said, Bhikkhu, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome, and hold to, and when he said that's the end of the underlying tendency to attraction, the end of the underlying tendency to aversion, of the underlying tendency to views, of the underlying tendency to doubt, of the underlying tendency to conceit, of the underlying tendency to desire for being, of the underlying tendency towards ignorance, this is the end of resorting to rods and weapons, of quarrels, brawls, and disputes, recrimination, malicious words, and false speech. Here, these evil, unwholesome states cease without remainder. When the Buddha said that, I understand the detailed meaning of this brief summary to be thus. Now, friends, if you wish, go to the Blessed One and ask him about the meaning of this. As the Blessed One explains it, so you should remember it. Then the bhikkhus, having delighted and rejoiced in the Venerable Mahakachana's words, rose from their seats and went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down to one side and told the Blessed One all that had taken place after he left, adding, Then, Venerable Sir, we went to the Venerable Mahakachana and asked him about the meaning. And the Venerable Mahakachanya expounded the meaning to us with these terms, these statements, and these phrases. Mahakachanya is wise, bhikkhus. Mahakachanya has great wisdom. If you had asked me the meaning of this, I would have explained it to you in the same exact way that Mahakachanya has explained it. Such is the meaning of this and so you should remember it. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, just as if someone exhausted by hunger and weakness came upon a honey ball, wherever they would taste it, they would find a sweet, delectable flavor. So too, Venerable Sir, any able-minded bhikkhu Wherever they might scrutinize with wisdom the meaning of this discourse on the Dharma, they would find satisfaction and confidence of mind. Venerable Sir, what's the name of this discourse on the Dharma? As to that, Ananda, you may remember this discourse on the Dharma as the Honeyball Sutra. That's what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Ananda was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. So, let's start at the beginning. So, it starts with this character... Dandapani coming up and saying, so what do you teach? <laughs> what do you got? And the Buddha says this interesting thing, right? Where he says, 
Well, what do I assert? What do I proclaim? Well, I proclaim or I assert in such a way that there's no argument with anybody, no argument with the gods, no argument with other practitioners, other religions, other people. There's no argument in, at all. And also, so that's sort of part one. The first way in which the Buddha proclaims or teaches is a way where there's no argument. And then the other thing he says is, oh yeah, and I also teach or proclaim or assert in such a way that perceptions no more underlie me is what he's saying. He's putting it in a language where he's not using the first person pronoun, but he's basically saying, yeah, and I teach in such a way that perceptions are no longer underlying what I'm talking about. They no longer underlie the Brahman, the one who abides detached from sensual pleasures without perplexity, free of worry, free from craving for any kind of being. So the Buddha is saying, again, without kind of using that first person I or me, but he's suggesting, or at least this is the way that I read it, is that he's saying that, again, I'm going to use the first person pronoun, but he's basically saying that I abide detached from sensual pleasures. I abide without any perplexity. I'm free of worry. And I'm free from craving for any kind of being. And because I abide in that way, there are no perceptions underlying my assertions or my proclamations. So those are sort of the two aspects of what the Buddha says to Dandapani. I teach in a way where there's no argument and I teach in a way where there's no perceptions underlying what I'm talking about. Now, of course, from a story point of view or just from a narrative point of view, just, I, it's why I wanted to teach this sutra. It actually was just this beginning part. Forget about where it goes. This sutra goes pretty interesting places. But this idea of like, you know, so what do you teach? Well, I teach where there's no argument. How do you respond to that? Right? Because there's, it's very interesting. And I feel like that's why Dandapani, right? He, he uh, wags his tongue and, and like furrows his brow. And it's kind of like, huh? <laughs> you got me, Buddha. Like, I, I don't know really what to do with that exactly. Then he leaves. And then interestingly, the Buddha goes back to the gang, back to the bhikkhus, and tells them, like, hey, I just ran into Dandapani, and Dandapani asked me what I teach. And I told him that I teach in a way that there's no argument and there's no perception underlying what I'm talking about. And that's when the bhikkhus go, what, what did you mean by that? Or a certain bhikkhu asks, what does that mean? Or how is it that you teach or that you assert or make proclamations in a way where there's no argument with anybody in the world or any gods or anything? And what does it mean? How is it that perceptions no more underlie the Blessed One? So that's what we're really interested in, is this those two questions. The first, though, how is it that the Buddha avoids quarreling? How is it that the Buddha's proclamation of the Dharma avoids argumentation? The answer to that one, I think, is sort of tacit. It's tacitly presented in the answer to the other one, which is basically in a way that because I don't have any perceptions underlying what I'm talking about, there's no argument. So we're going to focus, uh, I think, mostly on this idea of perceptions underlying a Buddha, or I should say perceptions not underlying a Buddha. 
but I don't want to lose sight of this kind of larger idea of not quarreling because actually this was my through line or this was my thread to last week. So if you remember last week's sutra, the Buddha basically said, all of the problems in the world, all the wars, all the fighting, all the murder, all the stealing, all the everything can be traced back to kama, the desire for sensual pleasure. So that was last week's sutra. And I wanted to keep going with that idea of like what leads to the trouble in the world? What leads to all the fighting, the wars? What leads to all of that? So we have this very dense answer that the Buddha gives. Bhikkhus, as to the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone. So the mental proliferation is this idea of prapancha. So the source through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone. So this idea of prapancha, let me kind of give you a a sense of what they're talking about now, and then we'll kind of go through it. But prapancha, or this like mental proliferation, it's, it's complex in many ways, but in general, the way that you can think about it is basically kind of about worrying about stuff and kind of like, a, we, we might call it obsessive thinking, as far as like not being able to stop thinking about something in a way. But you'll notice that the Buddha puts it in terms of prapancha or mental proliferation in terms of past, future, and present things cognizable. And what prapancha is also about, it's also a, a, quite a bit about planning, like this kind of like, um, but, but not planning, I don't mean like responsible planning, but a kind of like wishing. So a kind of, you know, um, it, let me, actually, let me back up. I'm going to try to put it to a really much more simply. One of the ideas is about prapancha that we're talking about. Noam's suggestion of projecting. So I, I the only reason I'm hesitant, Noam, is I always use the word or the idea of projecting for some other activity that we do. But the, the idea is, is that prapancha in a way, it it's like if I said to you, hey, you want to go, uh, you want to go out to dinner tomorrow night? And you were like, sure. There's a way in which you can stop thinking about us going out to dinner together. You can stop thinking about that now. And tomorrow when it happens, you can start thinking about it again. <laughs> but it's not going to be happening now. It's not going to be happening tonight. So you don't need to really think about it. What you should be thinking about is what's happening right now before you. Don't start, oh, and, and what we're really talking about is ideas of like, you know, oh, what should I wear tomorrow night when I go out to dinner with Michael? Oh, what, sh what are you, what, what might we talk about tomorrow night? And so now all of a sudden we're proliferating a bunch of ideas about a non-reality. Tomorrow night when we're having dinner together, that will be reality and we can sort of discuss it. But tonight, you sort of fictionalizing tomorrow night and you sort of imagining tomorrow night, maybe worrying about tomorrow night, again, maybe worrying about what you're going to wear or, uh, oh, I don't have enough money. I hope Michael pays because I don't have enough. So now you're worrying about finances. And you'll notice all this proliferation of ideas 
that has nothing to do with what is right before you. So propancha is this sort of, well, proliferation of ideas in that way. But my point is, is that it's not thinking about what is right in front of us. It's totally thinking about, again, it, oh, by the way, I put, I put my example of propancha with us going out to dinner tomorrow night. I put that in the future, but we spend a lot of time mentally proliferating about the past as far as revisiting the past, like what I should have said, what I could have said, da, 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 da. All of that is mental proliferation also about events that are not here. They are gone in that sense. And then, of course, there's also mental proliferation or propuncia about the present, which is, I wish it was like this now. And now imagining all of the way, better ways that it could be. And that is putting us outside of a kind of reality that is happening. And we are mentally proliferating ideas about a non-existent reality in that way. Now, what I've been trying to avoid is giving propancha any specific content because it's not about any specific content. What I mean is that it's not about obsessing about sexuality. It's not about obsessing about this or that. It's about any, any kind of propancha, you know, mental proliferation of any ideas in that way. So there's that. And as to the source, through which perceptions and notions born of mental proliferation beset someone? Well, the Buddha says, if nothing is found there to delight in, to welcome and to hold, that's the end of the raga anusai, anusaya, the underlying tendency or anusaya or anusya of raga, attraction, what they, of course, translate as lust. I'm not a big fan of translating raga as lust. I think it's any kind of attraction for anything, not just sexuality, but I know that puts me as a certain kind of Dharma teacher. But now what we have here is a list of, a list of seven Anushaya or Anusaya, these underlying tendencies. They are attraction, aversion, views, doubt, conceit, the desire for bhava or being, and then ignorance. So the Buddha's answer is about these seven underlying tendencies, which, by the way, these are kleshas, fully, formally. I know that we often refer to just greed, attraction, and delusion, but other things are considered kleshas as well. So these are referred to also as kleshas, but they are the... It's important to understand that a klesha or the language of klesha is about being stained or defiled. Well, what, what causes this klesha? What causes such stain or defilement? The underlying tendencies in that way. So I just want to show you the relationship that they're talking about here in terms of like the language of being defiled. Well, we have these underlying tendencies that cause such defilement in that way. Now, the Buddha is talking about here, which is a pretty simple thing. And before it gets too late, let me just give you the quick version of this sutra. <laughs> it's actually like, in a way, it's rather simple, but easier said than done. So when the Buddha says that, well, if nothing is found there to delight in, welcome and hold to, that's the end of all these underlying tendencies that lead to defilement. Well, 
the way to think about it, and I know that, you know, this is, again, much easier said than done. Well, the example that I always give, I often use this example. And what it is, is I, I have something right off screen. It's right over there. Do you want it? Do you crave it? Well, considering that you haven't had sensory contact with it yet, you might notice that you haven't had any sensation of it yet. And because you haven't had any sensation of it yet, you don't really know if it's like, it could be bad over there. Or it could be kind of really good. And because you don't, you don't haven't had a sensory input yet, you don't have any feelings about it yet. You don't have any vedana. You don't have any attraction or aversion because you haven't had contact. And this is where I want to stop and I want to acknowledge that this seems utterly obvious <laughs> in terms of, yeah, what you have never seen, heard, tasted, smelled, touched, or even thought about. You don't have any feelings about that which you have never had contact with. I know that that seems totally obvious, but what the Buddha would like us to sort of consider, or I would think, the way that I think of it, is that the Buddha would like us to sort of place our mind on such neutrality, meaning allow your mind to rest upon that which you have not had contact with. And what we want to feel is how cool it is, like how utterly still it is. The language the Buddhist would use is quiescent. It's utterly quiescent. And I'm speaking specifically about our emotional disposition. Notice your emotional disposition towards that which you had not had contact with. You are utterly Buddha. You are equanimous. You are cool. You are chill towards that which you have not had contact with. When we have contact with things and then there's a sensation and whether it's positive or negative, that's going to lead to mental stimulation in terms of perception, thought, and now mental proliferation. So now we're worked up about something, either worked up in terms of excitement or worked up in terms of aversion. But there's a kind of getting worked up about things. And so for a moment, the Buddha would like us to consider that chain of causation, the chain of causation that moves from contact to sensation to perception, which is the kind of the star of tonight, and then from perception to thought, manas, and then from thought to mental proliferation. So that's the chain of events. And the Buddha is talking about how if, again, there is nothing there, nothing there to delight in, nothing to hold, nothing to crave in that way, then that's the end of those seven underlying tendencies that lead to this kind of defilement. All right. I, mean, I have a few more things to say. Learning don't know. Noe, comment, question, idea? I didn't quite catch that. Um, it's the, the teaching I'm getting, right? I don't know to, to have the answer. I don't know. Where I always come up with an answer, mm -hmm. I always want to come up with a solution. I want to have the right view. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And learning to say, I, not, I don't know. Gotcha. That, that's what you were doing with your language. Gotcha. <laughs> yep. So Marty has this uh, comment. These descriptions are, oh, and I missed it there. Sorry, I'm a little late on the 
chat. So these descriptions are the suffering of existence conditioning, essentially question mark. Yeah, that's mainly the, the text isn't using the term dukkha, dukkha suffering in that way, and actually isn't even using the word defilement in that way. But yeah, Marnie, that's what we're talking about. By the way, really quickly, let me just add this in there. So these seven uh, anusaya, these seven underlying tendencies. So the first is raga, attraction, often spoken about as sexual attraction, but it can just be attraction. And then the second is aversion. And those are kind of always those two classic movements that Buddhism would like us to notice are kind of craving and wanting and moving towards or are kind of anger aversion that moves away from. And we're sort of always in that sort of push and pull of attraction and aversion. And then views. Now, the reason why I want to settle on views real quickly is because of what the Buddha was talking about at the beginning about quarreling and about argument and ultimately about taking up stick and sword and you know leading to violence. We really want to notice, and I, I would I would really put this out to you as like a thought experiment. But you know, if you think about views, drishtis, and you know, views can be things like religious views, political views, worldviews. But let's think for a moment about a view having, you know, a certain political position, having a certain ethical position, whatever it is. So a view, having a view, right? Now, Buddhism or the Buddha would suggest that we don't have a view. And what I want us to think about as a thought experiment is I want you to think about, would there be any place for argumentation if you didn't hold a view? <laughs> if I wasn't invested in this position or this view, if I really didn't have a position, could I get into an argument? What would I argue for? What would I argue against? Notice, no view, no argument. View, argument. So definitely we want to pay attention to that. Then there's doubt. Doubt, vichy, 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 kitsa, vichy kitsa, doubt. Let's remember that it's more, or I, I consider doubt in Buddhism to be more about certainty, confidence, like confident knowing versus a kind of like, eh, ah, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Like a kind of uncertainty, that's doubt. This kind of, ah, I don't know. There's like a hint of fear to it in that way versus there's a, a certain courage to faith, a certain courage to confidence in that way. So vichikitsa, doubt, being doubtful, and then mana. So mana, M, long A, N, short A, mana, is what is translated as conceit. But it's helpful to know that there is in Buddhism, the functioning of the mind in terms of thought. So the, the mental faculty, which we would call the brain, Buddhism refers to the mental faculty, but the mental faculty in terms of like the, the sutra, the sutta tonight was talking about the eyes and eye consciousness or, or visual awareness. And it was talking about the ears and auditory awareness. 
Well, there's also the sixth, the sixth organ, which is the mental faculty or the brain. And the functioning of the sixth faculty, or I should say, the sixth faculty is this manovijnaya. It's called manovijnaya. And the man, mano, the man is, it's actually where we get the English word men, mental, mentation, uh, any English word with that root, M-E-N or M-E-N-T, is coming from this man aspect of Sanskrit. So in Buddhism, the manovijnana, the mind faculty, when it functions, it's manas. That is thinking, is manas. Of, you know, of the manovijnana, there is manas. But then what happens is the idea of mana. I think. Not there is thinking happening, but I think. And that's what is actually being translated as conceit. But in other sutras, you will often see it translated as the conceit I am as like a full phrase, but the idea is, and it's very, this is really at the heart of Buddhism. It's at the heart of this teaching of no self. It is undeniable that there is thinking happening right now. What is deniable is that I'm thinking. And so there is manas, but mana, the I think, that's in Buddhism a, a defilement, it's an underlying tendency, and it's one of these seven anusaya. And then the last two are the desire for bhava, the desire for being, and we've talked about that one in a Dharma doors. I think it was maybe two Dharma doors ago, but we were talking about the actual like craving for being that leads to the utter absolute fear of dying. Now, of course, we need to remember that Buddhism is described as this middle path between self-gratification and self-mortification. So when we talk about not having a desire for being, we are not talking about Thanatos or the death drive. So we are not talking about what I mean is, is that if I were to give up this bhava chanda, this desire for bhava, it would not mean that I lay down and die. <laughs> what it means is, is that at every moment, I'm not so desperate to live. I don't have that absolute desperation in everything I'm doing. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is that I mean, I've you know thought about this one a lot from somebody who's human that does crave existence in that way, but I've done a lot of reflection about or questioning, I suppose, based upon the, the teachings. I've done a lot of questioning about like how that drive, how that bhava chanda, how it serves me and does it in that way. Now, the idea that, the idea that, well, but if I didn't have the desire for being, then, you know, I wouldn't eat. No, <laughs> getting hungry is automatic. Eating in that way is automatic and it's going to happen. And that's not actually what we're talking about. We're not talking about surviving in that way. We're talking about, well, I guess what it is, is it's totally connected to the mana, the conceit of I am. And if you've come to Dharma doors, you already know the teachings about no self, or if you've studied Dharma, you know this teachings about no self. So the desire for bhava is the desire to keep me going. 
but there is no you in that way. So your desire to keep it going is futile. You are just worrying. That's all in that way. So the Buddha mentioning it, he mentioned this at the beginning, but is free of such desire for being. And then the seventh, the final underlying tendency is the underlying tendency towards ignorance in that way. All right, any questions about that kind of part about the underlying tendencies and all of that? I did notice there was a question about perception and we're gonna to get to that. Yeah, Marnie's question about perception, we're gonna to get to that, but very okay with the underlying tendencies. There were seven, yep. Seven underlying tendencies here. All right. So, yeah. So then in order to really get at the next part of the sutra, let's address what happened. So the Buddha gave that summary explanation of why he said what he said to Dandapani. And then he gets up and leaves, <laughs> goes to bed. And the bhikkhus are wondering, what did he kind of fully mean by that? And then they're like, hey, I know, let's go ask Mahakachana. He's super smart. And then, of course, Mahakachana has this intro in the beginning that's really lovely about basically like, why are you asking me? Like, you, you were right in front of the Buddha. Why, why'd you pass up that opportunity only to come ask what, what does he say? Why are you asking a leaf when you walked right by the tree? It's a beautiful, beautiful sentiment. And they say, yeah, you're right. We should have asked the Buddha. You're right. But we didn't. Can we ask you? And he says, okay. And that's when he gives his longer uh, explanation. By the way, if I didn't mention this at the beginning, Mahakachana he is one of the Buddha's 10 major disciples, and he is famous for his ability to expand upon brief teachings. Like that's what he's known for in that way. And so Mahakachana expands upon what the Buddha taught and basically begins effectively a kind of teaching on dependent origination. So if you if you detected hints of pratitya samudpata, if you detected hints of dependent origination, then very good looking out, because many ways that's what Mahakachana teaches. Many of the sutras where he appears, he goes full dependent origination mode all the time. Like that's his go-to place. So he lays out sort of this connection between sense organ, sense object, and the arising of sense consciousness, right? Now, it's really important from a kind of early Buddhist point of view, it's really important to understand this framework and what I mean is it's it's called the 18 dattus. And what it is, is it's the framework of the six senses, their corresponding six sense objects, and then these six awarenesses, vijnana, or consciousnesses, but it's more like awareness. And these six awarenesses that arise dependent upon contact. And if you don't know, the basic idea of Buddhist psychology, of early Buddhist psychology, the basic idea is that you have these outward facing sensory organs, five of them, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body, and they face outward and they are like sensors and sensory data or input lands on the senses. 
And from the contact between the sense organ and the sense object, there emerges a sensory awareness. But what we need to understand about that sensory awareness is that it is dependently originated and it is equally sense organ as it is sense object. It takes both of those to create this third sense consciousness. And here's the important part. Let's take visual uh, awareness, seeing. If right now I were seeing something across the room, if you changed the nature, maybe the color or whatever of the thing, my visual awareness, it would change accordingly, right? But if I were looking at the thing on the other side of the room and there was visual awareness arising, and then I went and did something to my eyeball, changed the form of the eye or changed the, the rods and cones, the arising visual awareness would change. And what that means is, is that the resulting emergent visual awareness that you're experiencing right now is equally dependent upon the makeup of your eyeball and the makeup of the light coming off your computer screen or whatever it is. But it takes both of those in contact for this kind of third awareness to arise. And the most important thing I can say about this uh, emergent sensory awareness is that changing anything to either side instantly changes that awareness that has arisen. And now you have emergent visual awareness, emergent auditory awareness, emergent olfactory, gustatory, and tactile awareness. The mental faculty, the brain, sits inside. This is early Buddhist psychology theory, by the way. The mental faculty sits inside and senses, comes into contact with the sensory impressions of the visual awareness and the auditory awareness and the olfactory and the gustatory and the tactile awareness. Now, let me remind you, what I'm seeing is not what's out there exclusively. There's what's out there, and then there's my eye that's kind of <clears throat> interpreting it, and then there's that interpretation. The brain is in contact with the eye's interpretation. The brain is in contact with the ear's interpretation, Nose's interpretation, tongue's interpretation, body's interpretation. And then you know what the brain does? Interprets. So now we are twice removed from the original object in early Buddhism. We are twice removed when we are thinking about anything. Now, the point of this from a Buddhist psychological point of view is this. Right now, you hearing me, you seeing me. This is an emergent state of consciousness based upon everything that you're in contact with right now, including the contact of you with your seat, the, your body in contact with the temperature of the air in the room, the specific light, if it's very bright or if it's very dim. Every sensory input is then culminating in a state of mental awareness right here, right now. And if you were to turn the temperature up in the room, it would start to affect that emergent mental awareness. If I came and pinched you, that sensation would change your mental awareness. And so at any given moment, there is a state of arisen mental awareness. The problem is when that present state of mental awareness thinks in terms of me. There is no me when all six of those consciousnesses are constantly changing, morphing, and adapting. There is never a fixed 
you. There is only the present arisen state of consciousness based upon the contact that the sensory organs are in at any given moment. But at any given moment, that arisen mental awareness can develop the notion of a self and can then start filtering all experience through the lens of self. What I'm getting at, or what I've been trying to get at in this kind of long description is we want to understand the difference between contact, sensation, perception, and then thinking and then mental proliferation. So I use this one a lot to talk about perception, but it's the, our old friend. And it's the question of, so you have, if you have eyes, then you can see this. So right there, we have sensory organ, sensory object. And if you're seeing it, we can presume, what does the Buddha say, right? We can point we can point out the manifestation of contact. If you can see this, I'm pointing out the manifestation of contact. Now, now that you're in contact, there is a visual sensation that is happening basically at kind of a chromatic level in terms of what is solid and what is space. So your, your eyes are sensing again, what is solid and what is not. And I presume that your eyes are discriminating where the white is like not existent, void, empty space, even though it's white, but your mind's like, yeah, forget about that. What's that? So contact, sensation, perception. And what I want you to notice is that some of you might be perceiving a rabbit, whereas some of you might be perceiving a duck. And now, now that you have your perception, think away. That's the next step that the Buddha taught you. Now you can think about the duck or the rabbit. And now that the perception has lodged into thought, you can keep thinking about the rabbit or you can keep thinking about the duck and that would proliferate that perception that would proliferate the thinking now the problem with that is the perception is just that it's just a perception there there's no real duck out here or a rabbit out here. The rabbit or the duck, they're both just perceptions. And the question is, why, why did you see it as a duck? Why did you see it as a rabbit? Well, there's the conditioning because at some point somebody showed you a picture or a real animal and was like, this is a rabbit. This is a rabbit. This is called a rabbit. And eventually your mind was conditioned into calling certain things that looked certain ways rabbits. <laughs> and you were conditioned into seeing things as ducks. And then I showed you a, some lines some dark lines on a page that reminded your conditioned mind of the rabbit. And then you perceived a rabbit. And then you thought about the rabbit. And now you could proliferate those ideas about the rabbit. And the problem with all of that from a Buddhist point of view, it's not really a rabbit. So you continuing to think about it that way and proliferate that idea is not helping. So that's sort of the buildup from perception. So now we could go back and revisit this idea that the Buddha talks about how 
do, 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 do. perceptions no more underlie the Buddha, the Blessed One, the Brahman. So the Buddha isn't, or what makes a Buddha a Buddha is that they are no longer based on perception. And the thing about perception is that we kind of need to, and I, I snuck it in there real quick, we need to understand the role of conditioning in perceiving. And what I mean by that is, is this. So I'm going to give you a kind of a basic example. And then we're going to go to a deeper example, but a very kind of basic example of, of not relying on perception. So at the heart, at the root of prejudice and discrimination, is in a way perception. And what I mean by that is perception in Buddhism, samya. So the word is samya. It's one of the five aggregates. And the idea of perception is if I see you based upon your, maybe what I, what, what I perceive as your ethnicity or your sex or your gender or whatever, there's a way in which I perceive you. But perception is relative to the other person I saw of your ethnicity and your sex and your gender. In other words, perceptions are always comparative. And then we have a tendency of being like, oh, I've seen one of you before. I know all about you kind. That's perception. The idea of, of cramming you into a perception of some former perception versus actually encountering you like you and not cramming you into a perception of somebody I've seen before, but actually fully encountering you here now. No perception underneath in that way. So that's one basic way to think about this is that we're kind of talking about prejudice, preconceptions, pre-perceptions, I suppose you could say in that way, but that idea. But before we run out of time, let's go to that. D oh, please, no, please. Sorry, I haven't paused for questions. That's right. Isn't, isn't perception in some sense always dependent on conditioning? Like you can't really have a perception without having been conditioned somehow to have that perception, right? Yep. That would be part of the Buddhist psychology, that they are totally bound up together. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Maria. So um, you might be getting there, um, but I noticed what time it is. And so yep. I wanted to ask real quickly. Um, I, I understand that it seems like the Buddha is sort of going backwards in the chain of, con of um, causation. And then it all goes all the way back to when there is no I, no form. And I don't understand how one accomplishes that. Um, as that's just a pre, um, preview of the um, emptiness teachings or because there's no self, um, there, if there's no I, there's no consciousness. Mm. If there's no... Maybe mm -hmm. you can speak to that. Mm -hmm. Totally where I was trying to get. So thanks for the thanks for the push. So I like I mentioned that there was sort of like a kind of basic way to understand this, which is sort of about prejudice again and filtering th things through prior lenses. 
Maria's question gets to the deep level of this, though. Like, what does it really mean when the Buddha says the that perceptions no longer underlie the Brahman? What is it? What does it really mean? Well, again, my understanding, we need to keep in mind that samskara, conditioning, samya, perception, and to a certain degree, even rupa, form the body, but all five skandhas, the aggregates. Buddhism, especially the early Buddhism that we've been talking about for weeks and weeks, is all about not clinging to and identifying with the aggregates. Now that means one, not clinging to the aggregate of the, the body, of form, not clinging to and identifying as this, as self. And we've talked about that. We've talked about how it's actually silly to cling to this and you, that you don't actually do it anyways because you could lose your hand and you would just say, yeah, I don't have that hand anymore, but I'm not gone. So you already admit that you're not your body. Now there's this idea though of identifying and clinging to perception, to conditioning, to consciousness. And Buddhism or the Buddha has always been talking about not doing that, not clinging to and identifying with the aggregates. And then that, of course, leaves us in this, with this interesting question of, okay, then what is that? What's left in that way? Am I right? Is that like, if there's no clinging to the aggregates, then what or what's left? And what I kind of have, you know, started teaching or coming back around to is noticing that there is a tendency of mind to cling. And that tendency of mind goes like, ooh, my cup. It couldn't possibly just be a cup. It's my cup. This couldn't possibly just be a hand. It's my hand. So... There's this identifying with the aggregates, and it's a mental habit of clinging. When I mention that the Buddha teaches not clinging to aggregates and not clinging to all this as self, if you were to ask, and Marie, I'm not saying you did this, but if you were to ask, okay, then what's left? I would say, oh, look, there's the mind trying to cling to something again. <laughs> and so we need to notice that desire of the mind that needs something to cling to, cannot possibly rest not doing that. But that's actually what we're talking about is a state of being that is not clinging to and identifying with the aggregates. And the Buddha's talking about that because he's talking about that perception no longer underlies the Brahman, meaning the Buddha. So he's not clinging to perception. He's certainly not clinging to conditioning, the physical body, and what have you. The idea is, is that by not doing that form of clinging to perceptions, there is no space, there is nowhere for mana, the conceit that of I am. There is no room for views. There is no room for doubt. There is no room for attraction to. There is no room for aversion from. There is no room for a desire for bhava or being because we have just eliminated the very being. But notice we're not dead in that way. But we possibly have transcended these notions of existent or non-existent, being or not being, because that's what the Buddha is always pressing against is these very rigid notions of either on or off, existent or not existent. And that way of thinking is too extreme in that way. So, all right, questions, comments, ideas? Awesome. It allows me just a couple of minutes for a very, very special comment on this sutra.
So I kind of wanted to say a little bit more about this, but I'm glad we spent the amount of time we did on the on the primary topic. Regarding these sutras, though, so we're we're pulling back, and I want to talk about the the nature of a sutra, the nature or the the very structure of these Buddhist sutras. So the one thing that I want to draw your attention to is, so first of all, there's Ananda. And what I mean is, all sutras, as you know, begin, thus have I heard. And the I is Ananda. And, and from, a, from a long time ago, I was very drawn to the Buddhist sutras for that, that like, it's again, it's sort of a tacit admission that what you're about to hear is hearsay. What you're about to hear is secondhand information from the young Ananda. So maybe don't take it as the truth. So it's a beautiful disclaimer at the very beginning of every Buddhist text that what you're about to hear is hearsay. Take it as such. Fascinating. And then, of course, at the very end of the sutra, Ananda's like, yeah, so what should I call this one? And the Buddha says, oh, you should call it the Honeyball Sutta. But now what I want you to notice is that there's Ananda telling us, the reader, a story about something that happened. But then notice that the story is about the Buddha having this interaction with Dandapani but then the Buddha goes and tells the story of what happened to the bhikkhus. But that's embedded in the story that Ananda's telling. And then notice that the Buddha recounts what happened with Danda. They ask him the question. He tells them the answer. Buddha goes away. Then the bhikkhus go to Mahakachana and tell him the story about the Buddha telling them the story about when he encountered Dandapani. So the levels of recursion that are happening in this particular sutra are many. And I am particularly as a storyteller fascinated in recursion, which if you don't know that word, it, it's like when there's a story happening within a story or a beautiful example is when you have a stage play where in the stage play, they perform a play. This happens in Shakespeare a lot, where there'll be a play within the play. That kind of recursion, the Buddhists are really interested in. And I just draw it to your attention because it's sort of a level of sutra reading that I don't get to talk about a lot. And it's that paying attention to the levels of recursion, because you'll eventually notice that there's like a weird circle that happens in terms of like, again, Ananda telling us about the Buddha, telling us story. Anyways, it gets very interesting. So I digress. Uh, thank you all, by the way, for like indulging me and allowing me to, to, to do this, like share this. I, <laughs> I appreciate it a lot. All right, everybody, that's going to conclude this Honeyball Sutra. Um, stay tuned next week for a new text. Thanks.